earth. Uh, so anyway, so a lot of interesting events coming up. Please check us out at dphi.org. Uh, really excited about today's event. We have a uh, really distinguished group of international scholars joining us uh, from places that look quite a bit warmer <laughs> than Denver. And, uh, but uh, the, the discussion is going to be moderated by my colleague, uh, Caleb Coho, who's professor of philosophy here at MSU Denver. He's published articles on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy in a number of journals, including Aperon, British Journal for the History of Philosophy, Philosophical Quarterly, and Phronesis. Uh, he serves as one of the lead faculty advisors for the Philosophy as a Way of Life project, and as Phil Paper's editor for Aristotle, Natural Science, and Aristotle, Philosophy of Mind. Uh, Caleb has ongoing projects on Aristotle's theory of understanding and Augustine's uh, views on happiness which means I'm gonna to have to try to recruit him for this upcoming panel on happiness, I think. Uh, he is uh, the editor of Aristotle's On the Soul, a critical guide published by Cambridge University Press, uh, 2022, but really it just came in the mail as Gabriel, uh, uh, Caleb is holding it up. And of course that is the, the work uh, that will inform today's panel. So the panelists of course are all contributors to this really ex excellent volume that has just uh, come out. So. I pass the mic over to you, Caleb, and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, so here, I'll hold up the book and maybe make reference. Um, I'm gonna just briefly introduce the work and then then we'll hear from some of the contributors on um, what, their, what their chapters add to our understanding of Aristotle. Um, so Aristotle's On the Soul, often known by its uh, Latin title, De, De Anima, um, translating the Greek, Greek peri suke, um, is, is one of his key works, but it's, it's a little difficult to categorize because it's both really important for his biology because he's giving an account of the soul as a principle of life that's supposed to explain plant and animal life, not, not just, uh, say, uh, human personality and issues about immortality. Um, so so uh, it's at the root of his biological explanation, and he's looking for a unified account of what's in common ac across all these varieties of um, biological life. But he also thinks that the powers of the soul include um, noose, include reason or understanding this um, power in humans that he thinks is um, divine and godlike and is connected to grasping the whole nature of reality and, and being itself. So he both gives an account in this work, um, we get into how he thinks digestion works, um, but also um, how he thinks the soul can understand all things. Um, and there's uh, the, the, the first book of the Dianima, um, Aristotle engages with the views of his predecessors, makes some methodological remarks. Um, and then the second two books, we get uh, first an overall account of the soul. Um, and then his discussion of the three main divisions of soul into um, the nutritive um, soul responsible for growth and reproduction, perceptive soul responsible for um, perceiving and, and interacting with the world there and then and then rational soul with a further discussion of um, the, the the way uh, animal, uh, animals are able to move um, and so this volume has 13 chapters that uh, try to pretty much track the main the main subjects of the treatise um, and shed new light on them in some cases by looking at Aristotle's context um, in other cases by uh, going in depth on a specific passage or connections with other works, um, and also drawing some connections with uh, contemporary philosophy, though it's a little um, tricky there. Sometimes this work is treated as part of the philosophy of mind, but as we'll discuss, that's a little complicated since Aristotle's conception of the psuche and noose um, doesn't neatly align with, with mind. Um, so um, that that's a brief overview. Um, and then um, let's hear from, we'll hear from Jason first who um, contributed one of the chapters on, on book one. Thank you very much, Caleb. Um, and also thank you to my colleagues from LMU uh, Munich for showing up. I see some of you here. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm just gonna give a very short overview of my chapter content. Um, my chapter seeks to give 
a fairly precise answer to four questions. One, why does Aristotle think that earlier beliefs about the soul need to be reviewed in the first place? Two, what method does he use to criticize them? Three, how trustworthy are these reports and criticisms? And four, do these criticisms help to resolve any specific puzzles about the soul's nature, specifically the puzzles that come up in Danima 1.1 that seem to form a sort of roadmap to where Aristotle is going to go in Danima. In regard to the first question, I claim that Aristotle reviews earlier beliefs about the soul because, as he says, in doing so, we can benefit from any truth that we may find in those discoveries, and we can avoid any errors that were made. And indeed, Aristotle seems to accept that earlier thinkers correctly delimited some of the core phenomena that his investigation is going to seek to explain. As to his method, uh, I argue, I think controversially, that Aristotle uses a philosophical method of searching for a definition of soul that in many ways follows the model advanced in the posterior analytics. And that model starts with um, taking for granted certain empirical starting points. And in the Danima, these starting points are going to be that the soul causes motion and perception in living beings. I contrast this with a very traditional way of understanding Aristotle's method, um, the so-called dialectical method of examining indoxa or reputable beliefs by comparing them to other reputable beliefs. And instead, I argue that um, it's actually more informative to think about Aristotle as examining um, another class of beliefs that he calls uh, paradoxa in the topics, or as I translate, contradoxa. And these are beliefs about which the many and the wise disagree among themselves. So Aristotle's goal is not to really confirm or refute reputable beliefs by other reputable beliefs, but um, rather to point out whether a given contradoxical belief is explanatory of these two starting points that he begins with, that soul causes motion and perception. And I, uh, okay, so the third question I uh, tackle is to assess how trustworthy Aristotle's criticisms are. I focus in particular on his criticism of Plato and Empedocles. Um, this is because we have, for one thing, access to all of Plato's writings and a good portion of Empedocles' poems, if there is more than one poem. Um, and by using Empedocles and Plato's writings to assess Aristotle's claims about their philosophical positions on the soul, I claim that Aristotle ends up coming out as a very critical but fair uh, uh, philosophical, philosophical critic of these thinkers and that we don't have any really strong reasons to suspect him of any gross distortions. Finally, I argue that Danima one does actually resolve two of these methodological puzzles that he begins with about the soul. One of these puzzles is whether the soul is uniform in kind, and the other is whether it's divisible into spatial parts. So whether or not you have one portion of soul in your head and a different kind of soul in your body, um, the, you know, in your heart or your liver. And by examining some of these earlier views about the soul being contained in external air and breathed in, as well as platonic views about the soul having different parts and different parts of the body, I argue that Aristotle ends up concluding that souls of individuals are in fact uniform within the individual in such a way that they can't be split into separate parts, but the souls of different genera of living beings, plants, non-human animals, and humans have different kinds of souls so that in general, soul is not going to be um, a uniform entity. Now, all of these questions together, I think, and I argue, imply that Aristotle's treatment of these earlier contradoxa about the soul are necessary parts of his larger scientific project of defining the soul. So he makes real philosophical progress, um, but it's, of course, preliminary. I mean, you have to wait until Danima 2 and 3 for him to flesh out his fuller views. So those are roughly uh, the things I argue for in my chapter. Thank you, Jason. Um, and uh, next, we'll hear from Kristana Scheider at, uh, from Union College on uh, her chapter. Thank you so much. Um, is for, for those, uh, in addition to the contributors, it's so nice to see so many names and faces of people I haven't seen in a while. So thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> my, uh, my chapter is focused on Deanima 1-3, but is really about news. So, um, so I would say 
as I'm going to talk about like my main kind of discussion and argument, I'll, I'll just point out the first thing is I think that um, people often try to talk about Aristotle's account of news in De Anima 3, 4 through 3, 6 without reference to De Anima 1, 3. And so that's like, if, if I do nothing else in this chapter, I'd like to convince people that you can't talk about news without looking at 1, 3. Um, and really 1, 3 has been largely ignored except for a wonderful paper by Jason Carter. So um, I'm happy to just give it uh, some attention. So in De Anima 3, 4, Aristotle claims that unlike perception, the part of the soul that knows and understands does not operate through a bodily organ. Commentators have focused on this point as if it is key to understanding Aristotle's account of news, but Aristotle's really just toting the line of his predecessors, particularly Plato. In the Theaetetus, Socrates and Theaetetus come to the conclusion that the soul grasps the objects of perception through the body, but when it comes to the objects of knowledge, the soul comes to know these things through the soul itself, without the body. So the idea that the soul reasons and understands without the body is just not new to Aristotle. And Aristotle is very honest about this. He notes it in De Anima 1.3, where he says it's actually commonly asserted and widely agreed that nous does not operate through the body. So you might think, who cares? Why is this important? Well, it's important because if the idea that nous does not have a bodily organ isn't a new idea, and it's just one that Aristotle thinks is part of the canon, um, then it's probably not key to understanding his account of news. In fact, it's probably not um, part of his new, uh, um, what he's offering us. So the question we should be asking ourselves is what is new about Aristotle's account of news? And in the chapter, I argue that what's new is actually his argument that news cannot be a megathos. That's, I'm just thinking of megathos traditionally in Aristotle translated as magnitude, um, something that doesn't have parts. So, so what is new is that news cannot be something that has magnitude or takes up space, doesn't have parts. Um, and it's what's, what I think is interesting is that it's been assumed uh, by a lot of commentators that this point is so obvious and um, so obvious that news isn't in a magnitude that it's not interesting, which is why I think it hasn't got that much attention. But it actually isn't obvious. Um, and in fact, prior to Aristotle, as far as I can tell from my research, no one else has made this argument besides Aristotle. The closest we seem to get is Anaxagoras, who claims that news cannot be mixed with matter. And if we look at Plato, we see that he likewise, he accepts Anaxagoras' claim that, you know, whatever the part of the soul that thinks and understands is, it can't be mixed with matter. Because he says, like in the Timaeus, for instance, that it's an immortal thing, not part of the body. Um, but saying that something's not a material thing or not bodily, just isn't the same as saying that something is not a magnitude. And so for Aristotle, um, as I said, something that has magnitude, something that has parts, um, is capable of being set into motion, uh, has properties of its own. This just isn't something that news can be in order for it to do the things it does. So that's why in De Anima 1.3, before Aristotle even gets started on his positive view, he argues at length that news cannot be a magnitude not even in the way that Plato envisions, for instance, the world soul and the Timaeus. So there in, um, in, in De Anima 1.3, that's Aristotle's target, right, is Plato, um, where he takes Plato in the Timaeus to be describing cosmic news as a revolving circle. Now, a lot of commentators have complained that Argus is just being uncharitable um, and taking Plato literally, thinking that, of course, Plato doesn't mean this literally. But the truth is, is that whether he does or not, I don't, as far as I can tell, I never see Plato argue that nous um, or the part of the soul that reasons can't be a magnitude. And I think that's Aristotle's point. Um, nous, in order to reason and understand, just is it, it's not enough that it's not something bodily. It also just cannot be a magnitude of any kind. Um, not even an invisible magnitude, which is how Plato seems to be describing it, or a mathematical magnitude. Uh, so this means that Aristotle uh, is going to actually, the reason, another reason this is important then, when we try to understand what noose is in De Anima 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 6, whatever noose is, Aristotle now has the challenge of explaining how something that has no magnitude, no properties, no parts, no motion, can grasp objects of understanding. And I think that is the real big challenge he sets himself in De Anima 3, 4 through 3, 6. Um, and future papers hope to, I hope to tackle that. Um, but I'll just stop there. So. Thank you. Um, 
And we'll hear from uh, Christopher Frey from the University of South Carolina. Hello, everyone. Um, so my paper is on uh, Aristotle's account of what makes the soul a unity. Some of these issues Jason already mentioned um, um, just in, as they occur in Dan number one. Um, living organisms, they have a sort of privileged position in Aristotle's metaphysics. If anything in the natural world is a substance, living organisms are going to be. They're kind of primary determinate individuals. Um, and because of this, the soul, which is the principle of life for these organisms, he wants that to be a unity as well, not just a set of disparate principles. You then have to worry about how all of those different parts could be a unity itself if, if living organisms are gonna be substances. Um, but we do engage in all manner of different vital activities. And he, uh, Aristotle, makes certain aspects or parts of the soul responsible for these. So we engage in nutritive activities, digestion and reproduction, perceptual and locomotive activities, rational activities. And he takes each of these to be a part of the soul, right? So at least in human beings, the soul would have three parts, nutritive, perceptual, and rational. Um, I mean, plants just have the nutritive, um, I guess they won't have parts. Uh, um, animals would have both the nutritive soul or something like it, the nutritive part and um, uh, part responsible for perception and locomotion. And human beings have both of those, but also a part primarily responsible for our rational activities. But he doesn't wanna say we have three souls, right? Um, I mean, we sometimes talk this way, like human beings are rational animals, but he doesn't wanna have the view that we're actually animals and have an animal soul and just have some extra capacities, rational capacities sprinkled on, right? Um, I mean, I suppose you could say the same thing about animals that they'd be perceptual locomotive plants. We don't do that, but it would be a similar picture that human beings are perceptual locomotive rational plants. I, I don't think that's as common an expression. Um, so if you don't, um, if you want to say that the soul has parts, you need to have some account of why it's nevertheless a unity. And in order to explain this, Partly, partly explain it. Aristotle draws an analogy to um, another series, the series of figures, right? So there's a series of souls, um, there's an ordering to them, the nutritive, the perceptual, and the rational. And there's um, another series, in this case, triangles, and then quadrangles and pentangles. And they're also in a hierarchy. And they stand in an important relation. You don't want to say, for example, that a square is actually a triangle, but it's also a square, right? it has some additional features. Um, what is to be a square though still somehow depends on its position in the hierarchy and its relation to triangles. Either you can separate them and divide a square into two triangles or you could view a square as somehow composed or constructed out of triangles or their parts. Um, the way he talks about this, he says the, the lower elements in the series are present potentially or present in capacity in the higher ones. So the triangle isn't actually present in the square um, but it is present somehow. The square couldn't be what it is without the triangle being in there. Somehow he gives it a different status. It's present potentially. Um, and so this analogy is useful, but it does have its limits. One of the things I do in my paper is talk about all sorts of different contexts in which he in, uh, employs this relationship of being present in potentiality or present potentially. And the one that I end up focusing on um, and think is most valuable in illuminating um, the relationship among souls in complex organisms um, occurs in his discussions of, I guess, what we now call chemical combination, right? His views about mixture. So, you know, you've got various ingredients of earth, air, water, and fire. You combine them in certain ways uh, to have all sorts of other inanimate bodies, these mixtures. All these mixtures are uniform. They have a single nature as their form. They have a single principle of their movements. Um, but they couldn't be what they are unless the ingredients were present in them somehow. But they aren't actually there, they're uniform. You can't find you know, actual fire or actual air anywhere in a mixture. Um, so here's a view in which you know, the activity that a mixture engages in, it's a single natural activity. It couldn't have that activity unless the simpler ingredients were present in it potentially. Um, but it's not those ingredients plus something else. They aren't actually there. And so, um, this is the model I end up using to try and understand how the various parts of the soul form the unity, say, in complex organisms like living human beings, right? Um, it's not a picture where you begin from below, as it were, where you just have 
you know, a multiplicity of souls or parts of soul, nutritive, perceptual, and rational, and try and find some relationship to make them one. Um, I'm trying to develop a view in which there's a single soul, a human soul, which is a kind of rational soul, and it's the principle of a single naturally continuous activity. Um, it's an articulate activity, it's living a human life. Um, and so each vital activity we engage in, each vital movement, it's a partial manifestation of this single naturally continuous activity that has a single soul's principle and cause, and the single soul's also its end. Um, this does have some odd consequences. It, you, you know, you'll have the view that when you're digesting, right, um, it has a human soul as its principle, right? So that um, a rational soul is the principle of a nutritive activity, even though it's the exercise of a nutritive capacity. Um, but on this view, we wouldn't have three souls. Um, what it is to say that our human rational soul has a nutritive part is for a nutritive soul to be present potentially in a perceptual soul, which in turn is present potentially in our rational soul. We have only one soul in actuality, it's the principle and end of our single activity engaging in a human life. And uh, I try to defend why I think that's a fruitful picture about viewing why souls are unities and what it would mean to say that they have parts. All right, thank you. Um, so that's on the general account of soul. And then um, Mark Johnstone's chapter, um, uh, from McMaster University starts looking at the specifics of uh, perception. So Mark. Thank you, Caleb. And thank you for organizing this event. And of course, for editing this volume, I do appreciate how much work goes into these things. Thanks. So, so my, my chapters on uh, Aristotle's conception of the objects of perception. So an object of perception is what we perceive, right? It's something we perceive. So uh, colors and sounds and things like that would be examples of objects of perception. And my focus is on De Anima, Book 2, Chapter 6, which is a relatively short chapter in which Aristotle draws a systematic distinction between different kinds of objects of perception. And this distinction then runs through a lot of his subsequent discussions of the particular senses and of the relationship between them. So uh, my, the aim of my chapter is really to try to make sense of the distinction uh, and to sort of um, you know, really work out some of the details of what Aristotle's doing when he distinguishes the objects of perception into different kinds. So Aristotle distinguishes three kinds of objects of perception. Uh, so first there are the special perceptibles. So these are things like colors, sounds, and flavors, uh, which can be perceived in their own right only by one sense, according to Aristotle. Second, there are the common perceptibles, uh, koina aistheta in the Greek, such as shapes, sizes, and movements. And Aristotle maintains that these can be perceived in their own right by multiple different senses. And finally, there are the incidental perceptibles. Um, Aristotle's favorite examples are particular human beings, such as the son of Diaries, which are perceived not in their own right, in the Greek, katautou, but rather only incidentally, katasumbebekos. So what we, um, in the chapter, I, I begin with Aristotle's distinction between perceiving something in its own right and perceiving it incidentally. And, and I argue that basically this is a causal distinction for Aristotle. Uh, for him, uh, something is perceived in its own right if it causes perception insofar as it is what it is, and it is perceived incidentally if it coincides with something that is perceived in its own right. Uh, for example, um, the whiteness of a piece of paper is perceived in its own right because that whiteness is the kind of thing that can bring about a certain effect to me. It can cause me to have a perception of it. It acts on my sense organs to bring that about. Um, and I see the piece of paper because I see its color and its other um, features such as its shape and size. Um, so I don't perceive it insofar as it is a piece of paper, but insofar as it has those kinds of perceptible qualities. Uh, I then turn to Aristotle's second distinction within the class of objects that are perceived in their own right between special and common perceptibles. And I argue that for Aristotle, these differ both in how they act on the sense organs and also in how they exist in the world. So uh, 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 as I argue, um, special perceptibles, unlike common perceptibles for Aristotle, um, belong to homoeomeris or uniform bodies uh, on account of their underlying chemical composition. 
and affect sense organs along a range between contrary extremes. So this ties in with some of the things Chris was talking about, about the uniform bodies and how they contain the elements potentially in a, in a, in a mixture. Uh, so I look at Aristotle's, what might call, be called as chemistry. So I look at uh, uh, what he says in Meteorology 4, for example, um, about the different powers that uh, uh, uniform bodies that are mixtures can have uh, to have various kinds of effects, including on the senses. And I argue that um, something I think people haven't seen before, um, but I've become quite convinced of this and thought about it closely, is that um, Aristotle thinks that bodies have um, the special perceptibles, things like colors and sounds and smells and tastes, uh, insofar as they have a certain kind of chemical composition, as he understands their underlying chemistry, uh, whereas they don't have the common perceptibles in the same way. So the color of a thing might depend on its constitution, but the shape of the thing doesn't, of course. You can have things that are very differently constituted that have the same shape. And I argue that appreciating these differences allows us to explain the primacy Aristotle assigns to the special perceptibles and his account of perception, and also his claim that perception of them and of them alone is free from error. And I conclude with some brief reflections on the relationship between Aristotle's view and the familiar early modern distinction between primary and secondary perceptible qualities, at least as that distinction was developed in the early modern period by people like Locke and Boyle. And uh, I argue essentially that um, the, um, the things I've said earlier in the paper can help us understand both why Aristotle ends up his special common perceptibles distinction maps onto the primary secondary quality distinctions in striking ways. Uh, and that it's, it's also based on some differences in the nature of bodies themselves, not just in how we access them. Uh, but it doesn't carry the implication that it tends to in the early modern period, that one set of perceptible qualities is more fundamental in being or ontologically more fundamental than the other. And so I explain why that is the case. Uh, so that's what I do in the chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, Katarina, your Decano had uh, hoped to join us, but her, well, her flight was rescheduled. She um, briefly was in, well, at the airport, but now, but now um, she'll, she'll have to get ready for that. So uh, we won't be, we won't be hearing from her, unfortunately. Um, but I'll share a little bit about my, my um, chapter, uh, which is on um, noose uh, in, uh, well, in the, really in the whole day anima. Um, and I'm trying to push back against one common way of distinguishing Plato and Aristotle in the soul. So I think a very standard story is that for Plato, uh, the soul works best on its own. The body kind of ties it down, um, messes with our perceptions and understandings of truth. Um, whereas Aristotle's um, hylomorphism, the idea that the soul is the form of the body, um, makes uh, makes the soul essentially tied to and unified to the body. And then that plays out in Aristotle's um, understandings of uh, various human activities and affections, um, like the famous examples he gives of uh, being afraid or being angry. In those cases, there's both um, something going on with the soul, but also something essential to those affections um, going on with the body. If, if there, there weren't certain changes going on in the body, um, you wouldn't really be experiencing um, the human emotion of, of uh, human emotions of fear or anger. Um, and I think it, that's right as far as it goes, but um, things get more complicated uh, in, in the case of Noose, um, where uh, I agree with Chrisana that Aristotle is taking over some ideas about Noose as this divine directing, um, non-bodily thing. Um, and my chapter specifically focuses on this question Aristotle raises at the beginning of the, of On the Soul, whether, um, whether there is an exception to this general account that uh, affections and activities of the soul are together with bodily affections. And the exception he's interested in is, is the case of noose the and the intellectual activities of of understanding um and reasoning are they uh choriste um uh, is 
is that activity of the, of, of the soul, chorus day, or uh, separable, as it's usually translated. Um, and I argue that the question Aristotle is asking here um, is one not just about um, separability in kind or distinguishability from other activities, um, but that this kind of separability, either um, existential or in terms of ontological priority, would actually imply that um, uh, a soul with such a separable ability could um, operate and be active apart from the body. So I think that's the question. Um, and the first part of my paper argues that that's the question Aristotle is looking at. And um, the second part argues that he answers in the affirmative, that he thinks um, noose, uh, unlike the sort of uh, perception, for example, Mark was just talking about, where um, we can only see and hear things uh, insofar as um, certain things are, are, are happening with our body and our body is in contact with, with the world. Um, that's not the case um, for understanding. There, Aristotle thinks the forms we grasp in understanding um, can be grasped without the body um, in this immaterial way. And I think that's how to read um, the anima uh, or on the soul, book three, chapters four to five. I also point to an important passage in Metaphysics Lambda, where Aristotle brings up the soul and new specifically as a possible example of a case where um, a form can go on existing after uh, it's, it's, it's the composite and the matter ceases existing. So in ordinary cases, say when a, when a, when a plant um, body is destroyed. Um, there's no way for the plant soul to keep on persisting because it's it's its nature and activities require having that kind of body. Um, but I think it's different in the case of rational soul that its its nature and activities um, are able to continue without the body. Um, but what does that look like, and how how does that happen? Um, I I think there. The texts are a little um, underdetermined or difficult, especially uh, book three, chapter five, famously. And so, uh, at least in this essay, I don't take a firm um, position on what exactly this kind of continuing human noose Aristotle is talking about is. Is, is it one sh noose that all human beings share in, or is he talking about um, maybe something more like uh, the v sort of view in the Timaeus, where they're each individual, if you've uh, achieved understanding of things, then your your soul can go on doing that activity apart from the body. Um, that's that's uh, where 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 I leave things with with that that question. Um, but if I can show that that Aristotle, in fact, um, does think the rational soul is separable from the body, um, uh, well, getting people to agree on that would be a pretty significant accomplishment. Not sure I'll get there, but it's all in the chapter. Um, all right. So now uh, I'd like to hear from the uh, author of the final chapter in the volume, uh, Jessica Moss from New York University. Hi. And uh, yeah, just wanted to start by echoing what Mark said. Thank you so much um, to Caleb for organizing this and for editing the volume. And I, I said this to him in an email, but I got a just really helpful feedback from him on drafts of my essay in a way that has never happened to me before by being part of an edited volume. So I know it's a pain to do all the logistics, but it was also really just helpful. And I have so many times regretted not going to the in-person conference that was held at the beginning before I knew that my chances of in-person conferences would be utterly dashed for the next years. Anyhow, pre-pandemic. Uh, yeah, so Caleb had asked me, invited me to contribute to this volume um, and to write on the last chapters of De Anima 3, 9 to 11, the almost last chapters, where Aristotle talks about the psychological causes of locomotion, movement from place to place. Um, and that's something that I had written about before in a book, and it's always hard to know, you know, what you, what's the point of going back to something you've already spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, either you got it right and you don't want to say it again, or you got it wrong and it's depressing. <laughs> um, but it was helpful for me anyhow to go back and think about this again and to let myself think about, um, sort of write about something that had been on my mind and I tried to write about in Plato for a while, um, which is the connections between ancient psychology and a movement in contemporary psychology called dual process psychology. 
Um, so maybe I'll just very, very briefly summarize um, the thesis and of the paper and then say something about the project of comparing Aristotle to people who are writing now in psychology departments um, rather than, say, ancient philosophers. So the basic idea Aristotle gives us in De Anima 3, 9 to 11, a very kind of convoluted, even for Aristotle, sort of seems to go back and start again and, and say different things in different versions, account of what happens inside the soul of a human or animal when they move from place to place. And it's clear that there are two factors that are important. Um, and broadly speaking, one of them is cognition. I'm using that word to pick up on Aristotle's notion of what's criticon or crisis, something that can discriminate. So sometimes perception seems to play that role here. He doesn't talk about that, but rather fantasia, often translated as imagination, something like quasi-perception, like when you have a memory of what you perceived or you have an anticipation um, based on what you perceived. So you've got fantasia, and in the same camp as fantasia, you've got thought, which is something only humans can have. So I'm lumping those together as cognition. Cognition plays a crucial role in locomotion, and then so does desire. And Aristotle term, got coins a term for desire or excess. Plato just had a bunch of different terms. Um, and this looks roughly like something that plenty of modern philosophers would think. You've got cognition and desire. You've got something where you want something and something where you have some thoughts about how to get it. And that explains why you behave the way you do or why an animal gets up and, and goes off in search of water or any of those things. Um, so that big picture, I think, is fairly clear. Cognition and desire combine somehow to cause locomotion or purposeful behavior. What's a lot less clear is how they do so, what roles they play. Um, and I defend in the paper pretty hastily um, and a little dogmatically, but I defend the following answer. Cognition plays um, a really important role through evaluation. In other words, through identifying some object as good or worthy of pursuit. So it's not what's familiar to a lot of contemporary philosophers, the Humean belief desire picture where desire sets your goal, I want drink, and then cognition only comes in to help you figure out how to achieve it. But rather cognition is playing a kind of prior evaluative role saying drink is good or whatever it is that you want as well as the instrumental role. So that's one thesis that I talk about there. Um, and then the other thesis is that the distinction between thought and fantasia, thought and imagination, is mirrors this modern psychological distinction between this sometimes called system one and system two or type one and type two cognition. Um, so fantasia, imagination is something that humans have, but also animals have it. And it's not reason-based. It's impulsive, it's quick to use the modern term. Um, it's not slow and reflective and deliberative, but it's rather immediate. So modern psychologists would say it's the kind of thing you can just read the expression on someone's face and say, that's surprise. You don't have to go through a list. Um, or if somebody says, what's your name? You, unless you're mentally impaired, your name will just pop right up. Um, so it's that kind of quick thought. It's also imagistic. So Aristotle is pretty explicit about that. And that's something that contemporary psychologists think about also. Um, maybe it's associative rather than inferential and a bunch of other properties that it has in common with um, the way that modern psychologists talk about type one processing. Then there's thought on the other hand, which has a lot in common with the way that modern psychologists talk about type two processing. It's slow, where that doesn't mean you're you know, kind of slow-witted, but rather that it's reflective. You kind of go through a series of steps rather than just having an intuition. Um, if I ask you to calculate some mathematical sum, then you won't just boom, do it the way that you would do two plus two is four, just you remember that. You'd rather have to go through the steps. Um, so it's inferential, it's deliberative, it's reflective, and it's sort of in contrast with images and so on. So modern psychologists are interested in the difference in cognitive processing. They're also interested in the kind of behavioral or affective um, consequences of that. And I try to show that Aristotle's interested in that also. So if you've got a kind of quick processing, then that's very good for survival in lots of cases, right? If there's a threat, you don't wanna sort of reflect on the threat, you just wanna immediately associate it with danger and run away from it. 
Um, on the other hand, you can also be deceived easily. This kind of type one or imagination um, is gullible, as modern psychologists would say. You don't have the kind of critical process of saying, well, that looks good, but is it really good? Um, so type one process has advantages, but also disadvantages. And type two processes, or these more reflective ones, can come in to kind of help with the type one processes, they can work together. And I try to show how Aristotle allows for that, or they can compete when you're in a kind of a conflict state. You know, it looks good. So you've got this impulsive appetite to go for it, but you reflect and think it's bad. So you have a kind of deliberative desire to pull away from it. And I try to show that's something Aristotle thinks about in his account of accuracy, a weakness of will or incontinence. Um, have I been talking my allotted time already? I probably have. I, I'll just say very briefly, um, what's that? Yeah, well, if you want to go into the broader, that, that's where we're going next. Uh, you okay. know, what, 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 how can we, uh, what's the methodology and how can we make, make progress or comparisons more broadly? So yeah, go, go for it. Okay, sure. Yeah, so what I was going to say is, you know, you might think, well, either this is anachronistic, you're kind of forcing this model onto Aristotle. No, I really think not. I really think there are parallels there or like, okay, that's interesting, but what's the point? Um, you know, and like, just because you see a parallel between something ancient and something modern doesn't always mean it's worth writing it down or thinking about it. I do think that there are interesting upshots of this. You know, one is a kind of, um, a hope that people are really onto something. Aristotle was really onto something. You know, he used his methods. Modern psychologists are using their methods, but coming up with similar conclusions, and that's some added reason to think this is real insight into the human psyche. Um, and then another thought is something I often wonder about Aristotle. You know, what would he do now if he were around now? Would he be in a philosophy department? Would he be writing books of philosophy? You know, he does clearly have kind of empirical science leanings. He didn't have a lot of resources available um, to him. Uh, and maybe he didn't make great use of the ones that he had. Um, but I do tend to think in a way that I wouldn't say about maybe Plato, that it's not a betrayal of Aristotle to try to fit him into a kind of modern psychology um, way, of, way of looking at things. So I'll pause. I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, so I, th I think at this point... Um, well, we might get into some more general reflections on on the volume or the state of scholarship, um, but I but we yeah have 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 a lot of um, audience members here who who've um, thought about these these questions and might be interested to hear our our panelists. So I I think I'll just open things up for for questions now. If you either have a, a question specifically on someone's chapter, or if you want to ask a bigger picture question about, um, yeah, methodology or the state of scholarship on Aristotle psychology. Um, you can use the hand raise function or um, uh, ask in, in chat if that's easier. Okay, uh, David, yeah, David. So thanks for the event, uh, and it looks like a great volume. I look forward to holding it in my hands. Um, I uh, had a question that sort of connected to Christiana's um, paper and to yours, Caleb. Um, and thinking about the extent to which uh, uh, Aristotle is picking up and drawing on Plato, and <clears throat> Christiana, you, you were saying that 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 Aristotle is accepting the idea that Nous doesn't need a body, um, and supposedly from Plato, there's of course a controversial question as to what reasons Plato has for thinking that, and it looks like perhaps this is going back to Anaxagoras, and in Anaxagoras B12, we have this, this idea that there's nothing mixed into noose that would thwart it. If there was something mixed into noose that would thwart it, it wouldn't be able to control everything, and so it couldn't know everything. And so it looks like the purity, and so lack of mixture of noose and Anaxagoras, 
is connected to some sort of control and to knowing. I would argue that at least in some places in Plato, we get a similar sort of idea that if the soul or noose is connected to a body, is mixed into it, makes the soul impure, it can't control things, it can't know things properly. And so my, my question for, for each of you was, do you think that that's the reason why Aristotle is thinking that Noose doesn't have a body and how does that relate to Noose not having a magnitude or does he have a different reason? So while he might be agreeing with these previous thinkers, he's doing so for a different reason or is he also sort of accepting there would be some sort of thwarting that comes from this? Would it be the same sort of thwarting? Is it specifically the knowing and controlling aspects that are sort of potentially being hindered? Um, yeah, that's probably long enough for the question. Hopefully it was clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Chrisana, you wanna give it a go? Or sure. Okay. Um, so I, mean, I actually do talk a lot about that in, in the chapter. Um, so I'll just say a few things. I think um, I think that Aristotle accepts Plato's reasons uh, in the, in like the Theaetetus, for example, for why um, why news can't be bodily. And I guess by you know like derivatively, then he also I mean he clearly accepts Anaxagoras's reasons for it having to be unmixed with the body, right? Because I think that is why he brings up Anaxagoras and Danima three four. Uh, not to challenge Anaxagoras, but to utilize it and say, hey, you know, as Ana Anaxagoras says, it has to be mixed. It has to be something that's unaffected material things. So, yeah, that's the part I think he adopts and accepts. I think the part that is new for him is the part that Plato wasn't. I, how do I want to say it? I, I don't want to. I don't want my answer to go on too long, so I'll try to briefly say I think that Plato recognizes in his own works, particularly in the later, like the Theaetetus, the Sophists, the Parmenides, even maybe the Timaeus, Plato notices that there is an issue here about like that not being bodily might not be enough for thought, um, that there is going to be some problem with it being a magnitude, and I can definitely say more about that some other time, but um but that's the part that aristotle is like articulating and he's like and in in danima 1 3 what's going on is he has a really complicated argument where he basically he breaks it down in aristotelian style and says look if it turns out that news is a revolving circle then it's a magnitude and if it's a magnitude then it must reason about the objects of knowledge which are indivisible either as a part or as a whole and then he and he does this incredibly detailed um you know it takes up like several paragraphs um, to show that that if it's a magnitude it can't or it can't reason about indivisible objects of reason as a magnitude it can't reason about it in parts and then he's and then he leaves it at this really weird place where like it's like um well maybe it could reason about these objects as a point um which is an interesting thing to say and then he just kind of and then he just moves on um he doesn't really say anything about that but I take it that his his point is that it's not just the problem with with news being bodily isn't just the fact that it would have bodily attributes the way that um, Anaxagoras is worried and Plato is worried about it. Um, it's also that something being a magnitude or taking up space, having parts, however you want to describe megathos for him, like you can't reason qua magnitude like it just can't be that so whatever news is it has to be something that's indivisible in the same way that the objects are um and the reason i said that i think plato is not plato's not not thinking about this it's just that i think for plato he never gets to that point to make that kind of argument that aristotle is making because i think for plato he doesn't know what that kind of thing is um like and you might anyway i have many things i could say but i think we should let caleb go but does this, is this a fair, it's, there isn't a problem with thwarting when it comes to being a magnitude. There's other problems. Like if the soul were a magnitude, it would be its problems. So the problems aren't that it would be thwarted in its attempts to rule or know things. Instead, the problem is that's not the structure of reasoning reasoning couldn't have the structure of a circle or it couldn't have the sort of parts that there are to i mean not not that i know all those arguments but they they, they seem like they're different of 
yeah. of a different kind. Um, That's right. That's right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, just to say something briefly on his use of uh, Anaxagoras in three four, um, there I think I mean you you get this language about control, but then Aristotle says you know tuto est in, you know, I'm going to gloss it as nor noridze. So uh, this switch to, to cognition that um, I think for Aristotle, you know, knowing things is a way of having power over them and, or, you know, um, showing the, the, the extent of your ability. So, so I, I don't think it's unrelated, but but I think it is a sign that you know he's moving from cosmic news um, in you know and 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 exagoras um, more more to this idea that that the human news he's talking about does have this ability to sort of more like measure and order things or 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 connect to things and control isn't the motivation, especially if you read um, well the kind of overall reading of Aristotle's corpus that, that I'm inclined to where there's going to be an important difference between um, human noose that doesn't primarily have a controlling function and then um, what he has to say about about um, ultimate divine noose in, in, in Lambda that does have a controlling function but not uh, in a, its mechanics well are, 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 are very different and it's not going to be by contacting everything else but by being what it is so. That, that's how I'd read it anyway. No, that's, that's useful. I mean, one way of reading the Anaxagoras, it, it might raise similar questions for any, I mean, if the control is just moving the cosmos, like engaging in locomotion, you would have the sort of locomotion and cognitive aspects, both combined in news of the sort that Aristotle seems to want to connect with the whole soul not simply with noose. And so it looks like Anaxagoras doesn't want either of those hindered. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, and I think control, yeah, Aristotle's gloss on controlling and ruling is that, and this goes back to the magnitude issue, noose isn't gonna do that by pushing and pulling things. So it's right that it can't be hindered, but the kind of hindrance we're worried about is you know, intellectual impediments to what kind of forms it can, it can take on. Um, um, okay. So, uh, uh, Mate Hathelyi has a has a question. Sorry, sorry if I'm getting that wrong uh, pronunciation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, exciting uh, discussion. And uh, I have a specific question to Professor Moss. Uh, and uh, I would I would uh, like to ask uh, you about uh, this uh, acrasia uh, problem, uh, which you mentioned uh, also in the uh, in this uh, little summary and uh, also in the paper. How this uh, dual uh, processing theory uh, can be connected uh, to uh, acrasia, and uh, it is uh, very interesting uh, for me because uh, you mentioned uh, in your paper that uh, this, uh, this, uh, these two capacities uh, in uh, our uh, so, uh, soul uh, are uh, not uh, in the, just in the one way connected to each other, but uh, thought and deliberation uses uh, fantasia uh, as uh, fantasia uh, needs thought and deliberation in some cases. So uh, I am uh, very interested in uh, what do you think uh, about uh, acrasia uh, in uh, light uh, of these remarks? Max. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Hi, Mate. Uh, but sorry. Sorry. I am glad to see you. Sorry, do you mean in light of the fact that that thought can make use of imagination? What do I think about the possibility of acrasia? I just wasn't quite sure what the Yes, uh, I, I think that uh, use, uh, I, I meant uh, that uh, soul can make use of uh, imagination and thought and deliberation can make use of imagination. And uh, it is uh, interesting because uh, if uh, one uh, is in an uh, acratic uh, state, uh, then uh, some then there is some break uh, between this uh, fantastic yeah. and uh, yeah. between this fantastic function and uh, between uh, this deliberation and uh, thinking. Uh, yeah. So. yeah. So I think the idea for Aristotle um, is similar to and indeed a component of the idea that there can be different relations between the rational and non-rational parts of the soul. 
So if you think about um, Nicomachean ethics, um, book one, chapter 13, where he says, you know, there are these two different parts and they can harmonize the way they do in a virtuous person, um, or they can be in some tension, whether that's the continent or real, you know, real outright conflict, like the incontinent person. Um, and in general, in cultivating virtue, you need to get your non-rational part to obey and harmonize with and listen to and be persuaded by your rational part. So I think this is another example of that. If things are going well, here's a new kind of harmony that um, we might have not have thought of before is that the rational part can really harness the power of imagination. So when Aristotle describes deliberation in De Anima 311, thought uses fantasia. Um, uses different images that fantasia generates and kind of weighs them up against each other or constructs a new one and so on. Um, and that's something that modern psychologists think about also. And it's kind of common sense. You, know, you can use imagery actively when you're kind of controlling your thought process rather than just get, getting carried away by your imagination. So if you've got a harmonious soul, and that's not his focus in De Anima, he kind of mentions these things by the by, um, but it certainly fits in with his ethics, his moral psychology. If you've got a harmonious soul, then the non-rational stuff, not just the desires, but also the cognition that underlies them will be in service of the rational part. If you have a disharmonious soul, a disunified soul, then the non-rational part will be doing its own thing and the rational part will be doing its own thing and there's gonna be conflict between them. So similar to Plato also in that way, I would think. I think we don't see in Plato so much of an idea that the lower parts could actually be useful to the higher parts. Maybe that's a real advance of Aristotle's. No. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. And just to quick, quickly follow up, is it fair to say, I mean, that's a, a possible real disanalogy between Aristotle and the dual processing in that he thinks there is this natural harmony and teleological ordering between the processes in a way that some contemporary accounts, they don't even speak to each other or, or they're like always going to be in conflict? No, I don't think that the contemporary accounts would think that they don't speak or are always in conflict. So I think contemporary accounts would acknowledge that there can be some kind of cooperation, but certainly the teleological stuff, I think, is absent from the way that most contemporary people would think about it. You know, they've got this idea that system two or the, the reflective stuff is distinctively human, whereas the lower stuff we share with animals. So maybe there's a kind of a normative thought about that. But yeah, I have not seen among the contemporary saying, you know, you ought to privilege the rational. Um, right. The non-rational ought to be subservient. I think they're more impressed by ways in which the non-rational, the system contributes. Useful. Yeah. Yeah. Or not getting to the kind of full unity of life that, that, that Christopher Frey was talking about. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah. Rory Hanlon question. That, oh, sorry. Just oh, to, oh, no, go ahead. That, that might be an interesting distinction between Aristotle and some modern psychologists, but certainly plenty of modern psychology is interested in, you know, figuring out how our minds work in order to help us live better. So. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yes, Rory, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I had an original question, but another one just popped up uh, in response to uh, Jessica, but I'll, I'll maybe save that for later. Um, my question. My question is uh, for, for, uh, for Chris. Um, uh, so one question that I've, I've never really been able to get a, a firm answer on the, the figure soul analogy um, is why, why choose figures out of all the possible examples of uh, presence and capacity. Um, I think as you note in your, in your, paper, there's a problem with the figure case because to understand what presence and capacity of triangles are, you have to talk about separation and division, which can occur in the case of souls. Um, and so you might think that it's, a, while it's an example of presence and capacity, um, it's one that, that would mislead us if we took it too seriously. Um, and I think you argue persuasively that the, that the chemical case or the mixture case is more illuminating. And so you might think, why didn't he use that case uh, in, in De Anima to illustrate what it means for lower souls to be present potentially? Um, another way of asking, I think this sort of question would be, if there is this deep divide in, in, in uses of presence and capacities, ones that divide on separability and division and ones that would deny separability and division, is there a really like univocal concept of 
uh, presence in potentiality, or um, is there kind of a, a collection of related concepts of uh, presence of potentiality that um, uh, share some features, but also share some, uh, 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 have some very different features? Thank you. Um, well, the last part first, I suspect it is not going to have a univocal definition in the same way that he thinks that just the notion of potentiality isn't going to have one, right? You know, once you get to metaphysics data and he goes through various ways in which, you know, various contexts in which we employ both the notions of potentiality and actuality, um, he doesn't provide a definition. You have to be content to accept the analogy, right? See the way in which it manifests in various contexts and, and try and have some understanding of the, the similarities and differences. Um, as to why I think he employs the series of figures primarily in that context rather than others. Um, it's more because he's doing you know, double or triple duty with the analogy. Um, I mean, it's not as if he's, that if his sole purpose there is to describe the ways in which lower souls can be present in higher souls and organisms. Um, he's also in this context, you know, trying to make general claims about whether we can give a univocal definition of souls, one that would be satisfying one that could be useful in a genuinely scientific investigation. Um, and there are certain features of anything that occurs in a series which makes univocal definition difficult or impossible. Um, you, you know, he gives a purported definition in the early books of book two of the Day Anima, um, but there are reasons to think it's inadequate as a definition as he proceeds various reasons. Um, um, so, that's in part why he uses that. One of the reasons why I end up focusing on um, the notion of potential presence or presence capacity when it, as it concerns um, mixtures, right, as opposed to, to figures. Well, in part, some of it has to do with the, the disanalogous, the disanalogies between the series of figures and the series of souls, right? I mean, some people, some people do talk this way, right? Like, you know, if someone, um, uh, becomes injured or for whatever reason are no longer capable of exercising rational capacities. Um, I mean, there is a practice of saying the person's in a vegetative state, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly convinced and argued that, that, you know, it's not as if some, that it's not as if the human soul that you cease to have a human soul or you cease to have a rational soul um, and you've somehow separated the nutritive soul out and had been reduced in some important way to um, living a plant life. Um, so the, the ways in which he talks about, you know, triangles being separable from, from squares, right, through some act of division, right, you just divide along the diagonal there and you get two um, um, triangles out of it. That's, that's going to be a way in which it's disanalogous, right? Um, one of the reasons why I think the case of mixture is more useful is um, I mean, the soul of a living organism is in nature. Right? Um, and I think there's a surprising amount of continuity in how he describes just things that are, have natures and their natural activities. It's, it probably shouldn't be surprising that um, appealing to the way um, another natural body can have a single movement or have a single form or have be united in its activity. Um, it's not surprising to me that that illuminates the case of living organisms better than say mathematical cases or other contexts in which that kind of relationship of, of being in capacity with, but employs it in. One, one quick follow-up clarification. Um, so as, as far as the, the, the specific answer to Aristotle's choice to use the mathematical case or the geometric case in uh, uh, two, three, it's almost a, a kind of accident of the fact that he's already using it for questions around um, the unity of the account of soul. Um, but, and so for kind of the sake of brevity um, or conciseness, he's going to reuse the, the, the same analogy for the soul. Um, but that if he really wanted to take his time and dwell on this, this point, he would have more fully articulated the point by, uh, Rearticulating his conception of mixtures. 
Is, is something like that the, the thought of why, why he chooses the, the mathematical case? Speculate about his motivations in, 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 um, in, in choosing what he did. But, um, yeah, I, I often have thoughts about, you know, if Aristotle were taking more time, would he have done these things differently? But, you, but you, I mean, you get this in quite a few contexts. You, know, you, you make these analogies, say like in the physics using artifacts as uh, you know, your primary example of understanding what it is for something to have a persistent matter during change in different form. And then you try and um, port this over to living organisms and it gets a lot harder, right? To identify a persisting matter that doesn't have some necessary connection to the form that could be what it is and even just picking out what it is. Um, some, you know, most of these analogies are, I mean, they're identities, they're useful in some respects and, and, and um, not, not always as useful to answer every sort of feature at the case at hand. Um, um, I, I mean, he is committed to the idea that, you know, a nutritive soul, which would be actually present in a plant is present in an animal, but is so potentially and not actually. Um, going to the, the series of figures is helpful, right? Both, both as you were saying, as I was suggesting, you know, because it brings up general issues about definition and, and what they would look like or whether they're even available for things that are ordered in this way. Um, but I do think it's providing the basic model of the kind of relationship that would have to exist among souls in order for, you know, the souls of higher organisms to be unities, right? And to avoid there being, you know, a, a multiplicity of actual souls being present there simultaneously at the same time, just acting co-presently in, in coordination with one another. Um, but yes, if, if he then went on and said, look, now immediately what I need to do is develop this notion, I, I he could have written my article. He'd probably do it better than I did. <laughs> um, but I think it would be very, it would be to his benefit if he was just then trying to focus on the question I'm focused on to talk about other contexts in which that relationship shows up and, and, and then directly talk about the, the way it's present in souls. All right, thank you. Um, so we had a question in the chat from Megan Jones, who's, um, interested in advances in anthropology, psychology, ethics, and religious studies regarding animals having a soul or no soul. Um, and how I wanna, I'll try putting that as a question. Um, if we compare Aristotle's methodology where you sort of start that all living things need a principle of life, i.e. a soul, and then talk about which kind of soul they need and how those souls relate. Um, how has that kind of methodology held up or how does it compare to maybe another kind of method where, where you where you start thinking that humans um, have souls or minds or ourselves and then it's sort of an open question whether uh, animals or other living things also have have minds souls or or selves um, do do yeah do we think Aristotle's approach to uh, seeing all living things as in soul has, has something to be said for it or uh, just, yeah, ha, ha, how does it fare in, in, in light of uh, current, current empirical uh, findings? If any panelist wants to take a stab at that. Can I say yeah, a little? Sure. Um, one thing I face, and it just maybe not in this audience, but generally in, in spending a lot of my time thinking about souls. <laughs> um, there, there is kind of a, a general opinion you, you encounter where, you know, well, this is just a scientifically discredited concept that should be condemned to the dustbin of history. And there's a lot of baggage that has accrued over time onto what people just immediately think souls have to be like. Um, at least one nice thing, at least the way I'm reading Aristotle, he does focus on the soul being a principle of life, right? We agree that there are living things. There should be something that explains what it is to be alive, maybe more than one thing. And he's quite open to what this might be. You know, maybe it's a rarefied fire that permeates the body. Maybe it's a ratio or harmony among the bodily elements or their properties. Um, maybe it's a self-moving number. We don't know. Right? Um, um, I mean, he disagrees with all those, but but there's no disagreement that there are souls because to deny the existence of souls would in a way be to deny the existence of 
life. Right? Um, if they're living things, he thinks there should be something that explains this, some principle of life, and let's call that the soul. And now let's figure out what these souls are. And at least from the beginning, nothing's off the table. Right? Um, and at least I can see, I see value in keeping that framework, treating it that generally as just its primary meaning being the principle of life. And then you can go into, you know, right, we know that souls exist. Now you go on to the next question of what they are, right? or what role they're playing or how they play it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's worth noting some, some scholars, I've, Sean Kelsey, who contributed to this volume, I think likes translating suke as life principle or something like that, and, and instead of soul to avoid those kind of misconceptions. Uh, J Jessica, yeah. Yeah, just to say, so the question in the chat was asking about anthropology and ethics and religious studies regarding animals having a soul or not soul. So I think it's just worth emphasizing what Chris was saying that on Aristotle's view, if something's alive, it has a soul. So animals obviously have souls, plants obviously have souls. Um, but then kind of corresponding to that sort of generosity with the notion of soul, there's going to be a, a big lessening of ethical or religious significance. So the fact that animals have souls or plants have souls isn't going to automatically tell us that they have anything like we would now say moral status. Um, so I think for Aristotle, that seems a quite separate question. Plato has more thoughts on that, I think, because he believes in reincarnation, or at least argues about reincarnation, where you know, maybe an animal is a reincarnated human who went awry in some ways and maybe might do better the next time. Um, but for Aristotle, just, just acknowledging that something has a soul doesn't thereby confer any special status on it morally. Yeah, thanks. That's important. Um, Oh, maybe, maybe related to this, um, I'll get to Liliana's question in a minute, but um, I, I had asked the panelists if there were any uh, lingering misconceptions about Aristotle on the soul that they wanted to, to address while they, while they have the audience and the chance. Um, um, and, and Jason had one that I think is, well, about issues on Aristotle on the soul and mind-body interaction. So uh, yeah, J Jason, would you like to... Um, see if you can dispel this misconception and then see if everyone else agrees. Um, it's almost certainly gonna be a controversial uh, misconception, but um, I think at least uh, what I take to be a common misconception of Aristotle's theory of soul um, is that in virtue of being a hylomorphic theory, there's no problem analogous to Descartes' mind-body problem that arises. And so the thought is something like, well, the soul is just the form of a certain kind of body and form and matter are related, like the shape uh, and the bronze of a bronze sphere. So you don't have any soul body interaction problem arise for Aristotle. But um, I think that a broader understanding of Aristotle's uh, physics and metaphysics uh, says uh, or implies that this is really to put the cart before the horse. I think the soul body relation um, Aristotle's view of the soul-body relation grows out of a very long and complicated attempt, uh, beginning in the physics, to explain how things change in general and how things change themselves and move from one place to another. And to explain this, Aristotle is forced to introduce all of these unusual metaphysical distinctions that we find very foreign, distinguishing matter as a kind of substance and form as a kind of substance and their interaction and a unity in a composite as a kind of substance. And I think that um, you can read a large part of Aristotle's development of hylomorphism and his specifically his hylomorphic theory of soul as an attempt to explain using these metaphysical principles, how these, what he calls a formal substance is related to what he calls a material substance. And it's nothing of course, like Descartes independently existing substances, but he still has this idea of interrelated substances that form unities and their interaction becomes increasingly difficult for him to explain. So uh, by way of example, at the level of plants, you have the problem of how a plant soul is involved in nourishing its body and in converting the matter uh, from that it takes in from earth and water into its own plant nature. At the level of humans, you have this, the problem get more complex with how to explain how the soul of an animal can be affected by a perceptual object, how the soul of an animal is involved in causing, you know, an animal to move from one location to another when a, you know, a, a lion's chasing a stag or something. 
And then at the level of humans, as we've seen in this dis discussions of noose, it becomes even really uh, complicated as Aristotle commits to this idea that humans have this very special part of the soul or faculty of the soul, noose, which is not bodily at all, but somehow in practical thinking, it's related to the motion of human bodies. So I have to think about stuff and deliberate. And how is that going to happen? Somehow fantasia is going to play a role, but you do have something analogous to uh, a, a mind-body interaction problem, but it's happening at multiple levels and it's happening across nature. And somehow Aristotle has to deploy these strange metaphysical categories to explain what's exactly going on, activity and passivity and, and indeterminateness and determinateness. And so there are really exciting metaphysical distinctions, I think, that Aristotle is forced to invent to explain how souls and bodies relate. And so to just go, oh, well, you know, form and matter, they're just like shape in a bronze and done. Problem solved. That's just not what happens in Aristotle. It's far more complicated. Um, so I, I, I think that's a nice uh, uh, misconception to dispel that you, you might find something about, I think is sort of the origins of the mind-body problem being worked out between Plato and Aristotle. And um, they're the precursors of all of these modern problems that we have as well. Hmm. I just, uh, to clarify, here's, here's one way I think, and uh, maybe push, push back a little, though I'm very sympathetic. Um, <laughs> sometimes the idea is in the early modern context, you have these thinkers that have um, a model of physical interaction or body-body causes. Um, and then the mind is a completely different kind of thing. And so the idea is your model of causation just doesn't seem applicable to these two very different substances. Um, and I wonder, yeah, are you disagreeing that there's some important sense in which that's not the way to frame the issue in Aristotle? Because instead, it's, you've got more continuity between the models of cause and change he uses in bodily interactions. Um, when he then goes to explaining interactions where where the soul is a cause as 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 well as something bodily, Would sure you, or... he has a different he has a different metaphysics of of body body interaction. In fact, the easiest way to say it is Aristotle has a philosophy of motion, and the early modern period is characterized by the complete inability to understand Aristotle's conception of what motion is as the actuality of what is potential qua potential. You find it being made fun of over and over in the early moderns. They to just go, look, things move. Let's not explain what motion is. Let's just assume that things are bodies that move in space. And then you just have to account like what's happening when they hit each other. And, you know, but you have to abstract the whole world from all the changes that we're familiar with, you know, your, your colors and your smells and your qualities. And then you have this abstract conception of matter banging up on each other, but then you have to introduce force in order to explain this and you have to introduce primary qualities like solidity so that bodies don't just float through each other like ghosts and so you're, you're in a way reconstructing the world uh, on a completely non-phenomenological basis so yes aristotle has a theory of motion and his theory of motion um, has all sorts of implications for how uh, things are able to interact with one another and move one another in these different ways and that doctrine of motion um, will get applied to ultimately the unity of phylomorphic composites as well as matter being shaped in a certain way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the loss in the early modern period of, of, of a philosophical conception of motion that's, that's rigorous, I think, that helps to explain mm. the departure. So not all early, early moderns. There are a lot of good Aristotelian that's, that's scholastics. Right. Uh, Le Le Leibniz is a good one. <laughs> um, um, yeah, we, we, any, any other, other panelists um, like to, to react or comment on, um, do you agree with, with Jason on this being a misconception? Um, or, or are the, yeah, important advantages um, to this hylomorphism? I can just take that as okay. proof that I'm right. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's yeah. okay. Okay. <laughs> um, um, well, let me, uh, yeah, Liliana Carolina Sanchez Castro. Um, yeah, let's get to your question now. Yeah, um, hi, thank you very much. My question is for Professor Carter. It's a question that I have been waiting to address him since a long, long time. And it's about these short mentions, these brief mentions to um, 
um, anonymous theories or the one of Critias or Hippo in the first book. And you don't really treat uh, them in your book, but um, still there must be a reason of their appearance in, the, in this collection of proto-psychological opinions. So I would like to know what is your opinion about that? What is the, like the dialectical relevance or what is their position in this explanatory, um, I don't know, project of Aristotle in the first book of the animal? That's it, thank you very much. Uh, that's a great question, and thank you very much, uh, Lila, for 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 uh, posing a very challenging question. Um, and so, my first response is that I still don't completely know why he's interested in listing them in this dialectical context. Uh, my best guess is that he thinks that these are examples of people who are following in this earlier pre-Socratic tradition of identifying the soul with um, elements or materials derived from the elements, um, and that he takes this as, um, in a way, um, important to mention for the sake of completeness, so that he shows that, you know, if he's treating of primarily, let's say, Empedocles and people who talk about the elements, um, you can infer that these sorts of criticisms are also going to apply to these other thinkers that he doesn't want to treat in detail. So I think that if you if you target the common opinion of the soul being constituted out of the elements or some process of cooling of one element or heating of another element, then you're automatically going to be able to capture some of these earlier views from the medical tradition as well. So I think he, he may just find them not different enough at the end of the day from the theories that he criticizes explicitly. Um, or maybe he thinks that because they're less famous than the other people, it, the impact of the criticism will not be as strong as if he, if he criticizes Empedocles, for instance. So that's my best guess, I do, but I'm not sure. Do you have some ideas about what's happening there? Well, I have been asking myself about what is the dialectical relevance of these opinions, if they actually have some some particular importance in the in the building of all the hermeneutical device or or not um, i think that maybe um, i don't know i it's just guessing but maybe they they do have an importance maybe they are not elaborate enough and aristotle maybe is pointing to that that um, he can really sift um, interesting things from elaborate um, explanations, but not that kind of explanations that are not uh, that fulfilled. I don't know, but I have been asking myself the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we have a few minutes left that I wanted to take for kind of thinking about the state of scholarship, um, which this volume is ho hoping to contribute to, um, but where things have, how things have developed recently and what future directions might might look like. Um, and I wanted to start with giving uh, Mark Johnstone a chance to to um, sh share his, his thoughts there and then I'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Sure, thanks Caleb. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be discussed in this connection and Diana is not a very long work and it's been discussed for you know, an awfully long time, but uh, I think it remains an incredibly rich and interesting work. And I think there's a lot of interesting work being done and a lot of new directions and research moving forward, many of which are showcased in this volume. Uh, so, um, you know, um, I mean, one area of research that I've seen a lot of work in, which also connects up with a lot of contemporary work in philosophy of mind is paying attention to the particular senses. This is the kind of work I've done myself a lot and published uh, articles on a string of them, <laughs> smell, taste, uh, hearing, touch. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so um, in, in contemporary philosophy of perception has been a huge focus recently on the individual senses and on the relationship between the senses. So in what sense the sense is unified, um, you know, um, traditionally in philosophy has been a lot of attention paid to the sense of sight, uh, but Aristotle dedicates a chapter to each of the senses in De Anima. Uh, and also talks about all of them. I mean, not, not all of them in, in the Parva Naturalia, but he talks about all of them in various places, and many of them in the, his other short works on nature. And so I think um, there's been a lot of attention paid not only to the particular senses, but also to what, what unifies the senses and what unifies the faculty of perception. And this is a real 
live philosophical problem uh, as well. And so, uh, you know, in what sense are the different senses unified? And this ties in with questions about consciousness and the unity of consciousness. Uh, and I think Aristotle provides a framework where you can kind of think about them in interesting ways. And so there's been a lot of work on Aristotle and what's called something called the common sense. Um, and people have different views about that, but it really ties in with a lot of interesting questions about consciousness and its unity. Um, and there's been a lot of interesting work tying Aristotle's work into anima to work in other treatises, um, Parva Naturalia, um, I mentioned um, uh, richer connections, I think, to contemporary philosophy of mind. So not just as Aristotle a functionalist, although that remains an interesting question. Um, and that was very much the focus at the time that this uh, influential uh, volume by Nussbaum and Rorty came out. But, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, yeah, thinking that, as I said, sort of self-awareness um, action and the way Jessica was talking about earlier is another really interesting forum. And, and just thinking about the relationship between different psychological capacities. And then tying into the Aristotelian commentators, there's been a lot of really good scholarship recently, like thinking about how Aristotle's work was received in the subsequent generations and how later um, commentators in the ancient medieval traditions uh, responded to it. So I think that's another really lively area of contemporary scholarship on Dianima. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, yeah, and I like that emphasis on what well, I think it's very Aristotelian to work from the details of particular senses and then, then get back. Um, yeah, anyone else like to share their thoughts on sort of the state of the field and things going forward? Yeah, Chrisana? I'll just say a few things and then I'm going to have to jump off. I'm sorry because yeah. I have to right. teach a class. Um, but no, I've been thinking about this a lot and, and especially, um, you know, thinking that with it about it as we had our conversations putting together this volume. Um, one thing I, I think that has been happening more and more is sort of peeling back the layers of the centuries <laughs> of uh, traditional interpretations that we've been handed down, which I mean are interesting and helpful and intellectually stimulating in their own right. So I certainly am not intending to be overly critical, but um, it's a tendency, I think, when you do ancient philosophy or any history of philosophy to assume that the they're interested in the same questions that we're interested in, or they're at least uh, taking the same starting points that we are. Um, and I think there's been a lot of really good work recently and, and certainly in this volume of kind of peeling those layers back and looking to see like, well, what was Aristotle? What was his starting point? What were the metaphysical um, problems that were influencing his uh, psychology? Um, and just to give a, a couple of examples about th about what I mean by by kind of like really getting into like what is Aristotle doing I was just thinking in my when I in my chapter where I talked about Megathos one of the reasons I think that hadn't been really um people hadn't really been focused on that is Megathos actually keeps getting translated as if it's synonymous with topos in De Anima as if it means um you know as if he's asking about parts and and, and whether or not the parts of the soul are different from each other in place topos um and 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 I and one of the reasons that happened is that we keep taking commentaries and we base it on those commentaries and, and we keep going like that. So um, so I just I think that that's one of the things I'm really excited about, uh, um, just the really interesting scholarship that's been happening, um, trying to get at the heart of like what were the metaphysical questions they had and how did it affect their psychology? So. Awesome. Thanks. Um, anyone else? Um, yeah, Jessica. Sorry, I was just saying I have to leave also. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you yes, late. yes, no, no, well, 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 that's a good, good note to end on. So thanks to all the contributors. Um, uh, if you want to hear more, read more, get, 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 at least get your library to get it. I don't necessarily purchase it yourself. It's, it's, it is rather expensive, but, um, uh, and thank you all for, for, for coming. Um, to participate in this in this discussion, um, I think it'll be available uh, on, on YouTube for those who couldn't make it. Um, and yeah, always happy to hear questions or comments if you ha have in anything else that did that we didn't get a chance to get to. So, thank you all and have a good day. Thanks, thank Taylor. You, Good Sorry. to see you. <laughs>